Great. Hi, I'd like to call to order uh, the Marin Municipal Water District Finance and Administration meeting uh, today on March 28th at 1.30 p.m. Uh, let's see, a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Should we do a roll call? A roll call first. Sorry. Roll call. No problem. Director Ranjit Kush. Here. Director Larry Russell. Director Matt Sampson. Here. Vice Chair Monty Schmitz. Here. And Chair Jed Smith. Here. Great. Uh, motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Great. And a roll call for that. And Director. Items not on the agenda after that we vote for this. Yes. yes. Okay. <clears throat> Director Kush? Aye. Director Russell? Director Sampson? Aye. Vice Chair Schmidt? Aye. And Chair Smith? Aye. Thank you. Great. And and uh, any public comment on items not on the agenda? There are none. Great. Any board comments or staff on items not on the agenda? None? Okay, I have a couple of items not on the agenda uh, that um, uh, one is that um, we, we've committed to have HR as a part of our uh, finance administration meetings on all of our meetings. Uh, unfortunately, Vicki could not be here today. Uh, ben and I discussed her not uh, being here and one, it felt like it was important for her to be here during this presentation. And so it would be my desire to have some level of reporting at every one of these meetings. Um, but we're going to put it off for this one, and uh, and I think she had a prepared presentation that will come for the next the next uh, meeting. Uh, second is um, uh, it 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 would be good to kind of discuss risk. I think in finance meetings, and I've brought it up. I think at every finance meeting and other board meetings, but I think it's really important for us to understand major single points of failure in risk in this organization. Uh, and many of them have uh, financial impacts. So, you know, there's a slide that has happened recently. Uh, it's an emergency situation. I, apparently we're gonna apply for FEMA money to protect it, but there will be a financial impact on the organization to deal with risks like this. And I think it'd be really important for the staff to report out on key risks that you know we should be prepared for in the future. And it could be earthquake, it could be slides, it could be uh, other items. And I'd like to see that we could get that uh, moving on the agenda. Uh, and then lastly, um, we've discussed a few times in our water supply options and financial spending for water supply in the coming 12 to 18 months. And Paul, thank you for your presentations on, on that over the last few meetings. And, and to be clear, my, my abstaining from the one approval item was more about the fact that there's a whole list of other uh, water supply expenditures coming in the next 12 months. And I think it's important from a financial perspective that we get an understanding of the timeline of all of them so that we don't do piecemeal decision making on one item at a time, but that we have a full, thoughtful financial view of the upcoming budget and expenses for the year ahead. And so I think that would be great. And I think, Paul, you're working on that for the next board meeting, which would be wonderful to see. So we know what money we're going to be spending going forward. I have a comment. Go for it, Larry. Um, I think it's really important for the rest of the board to understand the reason we publish a schedule for the meetings is so that people know when the meetings are, including staff. And when we move things around, it just confuses things for everybody. And I, I think it is a really bad practice. Once the schedule is set, it's set. We need to adjust our schedules to adapt to that schedule, not that schedule to adapt to our schedules. So that was my comment. Agreed. All right, uh, moving forward, uh, I'd like to hear a motion to approve the minutes from the f &A meeting from February uh, 23rd. So moved. Second. Great, and roll call. Oh. Director Kush. Aye. Director Russell. Aye. Director Sampson. 
Aye. Vice Chair Schmidt. Aye. And Chair Smith. Aye. All right, terrific. So now uh, we're going to move to uh, item two on the agenda. Paul. Before we get going, I'm yep. gonna um, I'm gonna step out for the next two items just to avoid any sort of uh, concern about conflict of interest or given that some of my work that I do uh, involves legislative um, positions on water issues, so I will be stepping out for the okay. next conversation. Thank you, Mati. Good afternoon, uh, Paul Sellier, Water Resources Director. Um, so this this item is SB 23, and we're seeking the committee's uh, review and referral of the recommendation for the, you know, to, to support SB 23. SB 23 seeks to expedite the permitting of water supply, which is really what pertains to us, and, and of course, flood risk projects. Um, it's a timely opportunity for us. Uh, the bill is going to its first committee hearing, I think April 11th, which is Parks and Land. Um, and Aqua are sponsoring this bill and you know, trying to generate support. And there's a, a number of agencies that have already signed on. I forget the total number. The, the first cut we looked at, there were 39 agencies. I think Matt just sent another update out, and there's probably 50-something agencies by now, including uh, in the Bay Area, City of Santa Rosa, North Marin Water District, um, Valley Water, you would know as uh, Santa Clara Valley Water District, and Solano County water agency. Um, for us, as we ponder the projects that are ahead of us in terms of water supply, uh, I think you can all see um, the potential benefit for an expedited permitting process. This is distinct and it's not the same as sort of thinking of it in terms of circumventing CEQA. This is not an exemption to CEQA process. This is permitting that occurs as well as CEQA. So if you were to look at the aqua analysis that went with the bill, there are seven or so state agencies that have permitting uh, and, and for different types of projects that you're doing, and maybe four or five federal agencies that could also be involved. Everything from you know lake and stream bed alteration agreements, which we would get um, discussions with fish and wildlife over, uh, to um, potentially looking at changes to our dams and even navigable waterways of the United States, which would involve the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So just to really, at the moment, we don't have specific permits in mind to talk to you about that this bill would be advantageous for us. But just in general terms, I'd like to try to, you know, bring it down to our level, if you like, to see how it might help us. Um, so SB 23, one of the biggest things that struck me when I read the analysis was that it, it puts a shot clock, if you like, on the agencies. So once we submit a complete package of information to those agencies, they have a fixed time period to get back to us. I think it's around 30 days to let us know, yes, your application is complete, or no, it's not, and we need the following more information. Within 180 days, they're required to issue the permit. Uh, notwithstanding other agreements that we may make with them, you know, to extend that period of time. So having that shot clock, that time frame for them to respond is really helpful in the planning process. Um, and, you know, you could imagine any range of permits for us um, in, on local supply, potentially even Sulahuli, right? As we pump Sulahuli water up to the crest of the ridge, it flows through natural channels down into Nicasio. And we might need to maintain that natural channel, right? That would automatically trigger a consult with CDF and W, and depending on what the determination is for the resources in that um, ephemeral stream, uh, we would be required to come up with a permit. Mm. Um, so that's the sort of timing of response for us. The other is it gets into a, li a little bit more technical in terms of a, what's called a 401 water quality certification process. So this is any time you're going to be affecting the water quality um, of waters of the state. Um, and that can range from anything from, you know, if you, if you need to work in a stream bed, you may also need, along with CDF and W, um, a 401 certification. Often you do. It's sort of almost every project in a stream bed is going to require that type of permit. 
So this certification in, in SB 23, it provides an optional process for applicants. It's not required, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's nice to have options. Um, the process is very defined and prescriptive um, without going into all of the details. And it does, again, puts the same sort of time frames for responses in there. And it also would allow us and other applicants to use existing plans. So if we had, and, and these are not just any old plan, these plans have to have typically gone through the CEQA process, been adopted by our board, been a, you know, considered by the state as well. Um, so I, I don't know to what extent that's gonna directly help us, but you can imagine a situation where you have a patchwork of these plans that exist, that have good analysis in them, and maybe we just need to fill in the gaps. Um, and what's important about this is it's a time saver, not only time, but money, of course, because some of these environmental uh, reviews, um, you know, require collection of field data and they take time because that data can have seasonal dependencies. Um, so using existing plans. Um, now, that's not to say that the state or the permitting agency has to use those plans. There is a process that they can go through to determine, for example, that they don't meet the requirements as defined in SB 23, in which case we would be required to fill that requirement in another way. So it's not an automatic process. Again, it's not an attempt, I think, to get around CEQA. It's just to take advantage of existing information with a, with a view. And this is the whole tenet of SB 23 is to expedite this permitting process. Um, Furthermore, SB 23 allows the state permitting agencies to hire resources to, you know, to allow us to pay for and hire resources to consider an expedited review. So if we, you know, we have this huge amount of work for them to do, they don't have the staff, we can enter into an arrangement where they can hire someone directly to review this work on our behalf. Um, and then another technical aspect, again, th this relates to the U.S. Army Corps has a number of general orders and uh, SB 23, we require the state to come up with general water quality certifications for these general orders. It's sort of like a general permit and you would have now general water quality certifications for these activities. Um, again, I don't know the extent to which that would apply to us, um, but the key here is on those, in that process of general orders, typically you're required to do NEPA and California law requires you to do CEQA. There is an uh, existing, I think in the law that says that you can use NEPA to satisfy CEQA uh, in, in terms of EIR and EIS requirements. And this bill would sort of codify that. Um, so, another... so, sorry, Paul, to interrupt. I've heard uh, NEPA come up in other discussions. I don't know what it is, though. It's the sort of federal Same equivalent thing. of CEQA. Um, it, it, it has generally, I think, tighter requirements. Molly, I don't know if you would care to comment on the differences. It's the National Environmental Policy Act, and it is the federal equivalency to CEQA. Um, I'd say whether it's more strict or not really yeah. depends on the specific provisions. Oftentimes right. you can do, um, you know, one set of analysis to help um, meet both qualifications. And NEPA comes into play if you're getting federal funds or if you're working with a federal agency for a permit or certification, then NEPA would come into play. So not in every case do we have to address NEPA. Thanks. Um, so I think that's, that's really all I wanted to get into in terms of the specifics of of SB 23, um, so it's, it's not an attempt to circumvent CEQA, it's hoping to expedite the permitting process. Um, and as written, I think it could be beneficial for the district going forward, considering the slate of water, water uh, supply projects that we undoubtedly have in front of us. Um, as far as the timing goes, as I mentioned, April 11th is the first, uh, first committee hearing on parks and land. So if there are any questions. Matt, um, with a imposed timeline, and and I fully support the um, ability to move things through quicker, especially if they're done thoroughly in that same time frame. But with the 180 day timeline, is there concern that these agencies wouldn't be able to meet that based on current staffing? 
and this would cause more of an issue down the road? Um, I think that's part of the reason that the bill calls out for the ability for the agencies to contract work and then charge us for that. So again, this some of this process in SB 23 is optional. So we would be electing, for example, to take on the 401 uh, water quality certification process as described in the bill. And then that would presumably trigger uh, the agency to ask us for resources to support that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, I, um, you know, I understand that there will be from maybe other groups concerns about checks and balances being diminished and, and, and so, you know, possibly unintended consequences of the streamlining act are there. And ne nevertheless, I think, you know, um, as a, as a relatively small water agency dependent primarily on local supplies, our, you know, the, the, the consequences of on our, our, you know, our acts are not going to be seen as significantly harmful or, or, or risk, risky, let's say risky, you know, I, I think the risk that we would be um, accused of, of enhancing is, is minimal at MMWD. But are, within this process, are there other organizations or industries that potentially are prone to more risky activities? more risky environmental activities that might be benefiting from reduced oversight through this. And, and then I have one other specific question, but one thing that caught my eye was our for agency's abilities now to hire contractors to do some of that permitting. Specific, is there risk of conflict of interest in that, in that activity? Um, so I'll start, Ben. I, I was just gonna share on the Clean Water Act world, kind of wastewater permitting, it's it became has become a fairly common practice where if you have a big effort on something like we may have in front of us, you're able to work with the water board and have a third party. It's their consultant typically. So it's really just a mechanism for the permittee to pay for resources that they select and they manage. So there's really not a conflict because they, they use some measure of consultants anyway. It's really a revenue stream and a way to get around. I don't have the resources to get to it. And then the first part, maybe. Yeah, in terms of the risk, you know, so SB 23 is very specifically targeted to water supply and flood risk projects. So it's not sort of a, um, you know, panacea application. Um, and to Ben's point, uh, when we developed the NPDES permit for, for drinking water discharges across the state, it was a, a collection of eight Bay Area agencies that we got together and we funded um, through an ABAG contract, the hiring of staff for the regional board in San Francisco to help put that permit together. So it's it's a paradigm that's been been followed. Okay, good. So it's it's not sort of a blanket uh, activity or something that would cover multiple activities related to water resources management. This is something really targeted towards streamlining procedures for water suppliers. Yeah, that's. Okay, that's a good good clarification. Thank you. Yeah. Larry, any comments? Yeah, Who, who's driving the vote? Uh, it's a, it's um, coming out of Caballero's, Senator Caballero's oh, that, office in who, Aqua. Who, who, who's actually driving the vote? Aqua is the sponsor. Are they the ones that conceived it? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I'm just curious to see how big the water buffaloes are. Yeah, well, yeah, there's, there's a, quite a list of folks. Um, attached to support at the moment. Uh, the biggest Bay Area one is, is Santa Clara. Can I ask one more quick question? Yep. So you um, just to touch on the support piece, are there any um, water agencies in the area that are against, coming out against? That's a, it's a good question. I actually asked Matt if he had seen any opposed pieces on this, um, recognizing that there isn't a piece of legislation, right, that goes through without any opposition. So, but no, I haven't seen any, Director Sampson, I have not. How about the fish people? Again, we haven't really heard much in terms of um, opposed pieces. I, I do understand there's 
environmental groups that are looking at this right. that generally the you know the governor has taken some action um during these storms to wave or i'm not exactly sure but dealing with the ability to divert water for groundwater recharge during these storms that um was maybe similar but it was a governor's action more targeted um so anyway i i think there is some broad concern <clears throat> that will be expressed through the legislative process of you know where don't so wh where's our concern and you know through the sausage making of the bill um and what we would i mean the, there's many options for the board one would be to take a position now as Zach was asking another would be to watch and see how it goes if you took a position now of support we bring the various versions to the board and get more granular on the issue. So there's a range of approaches you could take. What would be the downside of supporting? Um, at this point, um, I think not a lot in that it's kind of supporting the industry. I think generally um, it's a benefit to agencies of our size for Aqua to take the lead and do heavy lifting on legislation. And as a practice, I think it's good to support the association in that to the extent there's not a concern on a policy matter. I want to give a little bit about who Aqua is. Yeah, we've talked a little bit. They're the statewide association for water that really does focus on this sort of legislative, legal, regulatory policy area in support of the industry. Um, they, they have legislative committees and there is quite robust process for Aqua to agree to sponsor a bill within the water industry. Often there's north-south divides or rural urban divides that sort of stuff so for it to come out that there certainly has been a fairly i i wasn't there i don't know if matt was but typically a fairly healthy debate in the industry before it rises up yeah i think my understanding uh larry is that the um there was a proposition one around 2014 that had about three billion dollars worth of water supply projects and almost none of them have come through mm. And and so I, I gather that there is a directive from the administration, the state administration, to try to streamline this process a little bit more. And that there's an expectation that there'll be significant more funds in the coming year that could be made available. And I think this would specifically address that, if I'm not mistaken, so that possibly the, the new funds won't be subject to some of the review that the last proposition won $3 billion that slowed everything down. So I, I believe that's where the driver is. Um, and I think what I'm understanding is that the pushback against this is mostly from environmental groups that are concerned that this would this would kind of uh, get in the way of of some other issues beyond water supply. So it could be issues that we de deal with directly. It could be people that are concerned about coho salmon or so, frogs or other other. Um, uh, endangered species or threatened species that we have here. And so we're somewhat unique as every district is in, in how we handle and, and what we, what we govern, which is, um, a lot of watershed concerns, a lot of species and habitat concerns, and a lot of recreation use of our land. Um, so I think my, my, uh, understanding is that we actually could benefit from this, uh, in the coming year. Uh, and and I, I hope that we're getting in line for the monies that are going to be uh, created and streamlined and use it for our best purposes. My biggest concern is that there could be projects that are approved elsewhere in the state that uh, we would not like that may uh, that may that may hurt fisheries, that may hurt environmental concerns, that may hurt habitat, and that our constituents really would not necessarily want to get behind. And so. Uh, I, I, I kind of go back to the question before, which is, I can understand some of the benefits for us. I'm nervous about um, about uh, some of the broader repercussions. And so why, what would be the benefit of writing a letter of support besides just supporting Aqua? Uh, it seems like I, we should probably just wait and see how it goes and 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 look for further clarification on on what might be streamlined. I, I, 
think I would probably lean towards staying on the sidelines in this one for now. I think it's going to be increasingly controversial as it comes into um, reality. Uh, for today, are we considering a recommendation to the full board? Is that the... It's a, a yeah request for referral, obviously, with, as Ben indicated, with the committee's preference. Or, uh, but if you're going to adopt a wait and see, would we still refer that, Ben? Or um, it, it would just be a first and a second for referral to the full board um, per our process. Um, and is, if there isn't a first and a second, then it's not referred. Right. But there's like 10 options. How, how do we get the <laughs> option to find well, I believe the recommendation is for support, but um, right. certainly Which that's open to discussion. Support, okay, the one, the first one. On, on attachment well, two. We could take a early watch position that puts this kind of, it's basically the board's direction to staff that we want to be updated as this moves. Um, it may be a good fit if at this point the board didn't want to proceed with support. Well, uh, I'll say this. Um, we don't usually get asked about other projects. So the, the likelihood, while they may benefit indirectly, it's probably going to pass anyway. My, my assessment would be um, I don't see a lot of downside in supporting it, just looking at it. Uh, doesn't seem to cause any uh, unusual things to happen. There are still anti-backsliding provisions in the laws that can't soften them just because it's speeded up. I think it's, what I read of it, it's just bureaucratic. It, it's, it seems that way to me, that it's process and not substance. It's not changing any of the statutes, state or federal, that are there to protect and endangered species and other things. It's just designed to move things along in a faster, more predictable way. And Aqua is asking us to do this? Yeah, they've put a request out to all their members to sign on to support. Because, right, the more members, the more interest the author maintains in the committee that'll first hear it um, to say that you know, 80% of Aqua members that represent what percent of the represented population in the state. It, it gives the committee sure. a sense of. Yeah, I'm definitely not educated enough to offer amendments to this <laughs> bill, right? Um, and so, uh, I mean, I, I'd, I'd push for being in favor of it. Uh, and and let's just see how, how it comes forward. It'd just be hard for us to Say that we should actively advocate for it. I, I, I mean, <clears throat> I think that's an option is just to 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 wait and watch um, as opposed to support at this time. It's it's really uh, up to to the board to um, decide to refer and how to refer it. Um, certainly can keep an eye on it. I I don't know. Um, I haven't been involved in any of the discussion, but I would be surprised if there weren't probably some amendments that would happen. Um, just looking at the language myself, I could see a couple that might be suggested if I were to, um, if I were, you know, looking at it and scrutinizing it for making sure that process was, uh, um, you know, not going to cut off um, substantive concerns. Um, but, you know, I think I, overall, I think it is a, you know, it, it is helpful to water agencies because it can be quite a laborious and lengthy process in some of these cases. Um, I, I'd support the, the watch and see piece at this point too. Um, along with that, because I think at some point too, there is a concern that when you ask for additional funds to expedite a process, all you're doing is essentially driving up the cost of all these projects all around the board too. So I think that's an important thing to consider as well as what the unintended consequences would be of that. And if these agencies actually can support meeting those guidelines and the ones that can't afford to do it. So I'd like to um, also support the wait and see. Probably lowers the cost actually, because if you wait on the project inflation catches up with you. So it probably ends the net lowering of the cost, uh, I would think. Uh, I, I'm willing to make the motion to support. Um, we have a second bite at it, which is on the consent calendar. So uh, we can see what the public says, if we wish, at that point. So I, I'll make the motion to support. 
And if there's no second, then there's no second. Just, just to um, summarize, the if if we uh, adopt the wait and see position at this point, the <clears throat> the um, you know it it potentially signals slightly. It provides maybe a slightly weaker signal to the um, you know the proponents of the of the bill. Um, you know, in that, you know, uh, Aqua may not get 100% of its constituency on board, but beyond that, are, are the consequences much it's stronger? It's hard to see at this point that there's um, a significant or even measurable consequence of not supporting it today. Is this is really and, and vice versa. There probably is a negligible consequence of us supporting it. And, we're we're and, too small. Absolutely. to be a player. I, I think the time that becomes more important is when we have the opportunity to go to our members that represent us and say, we're supporting it for this reason, you know, when they're starting to vote or if they're on the committee, that sort of stuff. The signal, this is good for us. So get they, that data point is you're probably getting data points from others who may not look at it. Yeah, I, I think it will be noticed inside of Aqua. I don't think it will be noticed outside of Aqua. And, and there are some big players that so far are not indicated as support. Um, you heard in the Bay Area, it's Parker and Santa Rosa and um, Valley Water. That leaves a lot out. Right. So there's probably other agencies. Yeah, I think Sonoma hasn't supported it yet. East Bay Mud has not. Yeah. San Francisco. So We'd be relatively early in this. Yeah. I mean, but can we put a motion to be in favor of it? Is that is that an option? <laughs> <laughs> you know, which is one of your options, and then wait and see. Yeah. yeah. Board you speak in your mic, they can't hear you on. Thank you. Topic. Sorry about that. I I'd suggest the board consider one of three um, of a support formal review uh, refer to the main board a formal watch position that would go as a referral to the board or just an informal wait and see my sense from this discussion may be the middle one signals you, the board's interested you want to track it you want staff to come back that's really what a watch would do at this point yeah, I, I would motion for that middle scenario. And and I also want to hear public opinion on it. I think that'd be helpful for us. So, I, I mean, in general, I'm in favor of it. I just want to see where this comes out and what the what the pushback is. I want to see the other side as well. I understand the benefits. And and no doubt, we're going to be taking advantage of the benefits as best as we can of this, this bill. Yeah, maybe, maybe just to um, second that, I think it's it would be it would just be so helpful to see what the concerns are going to be, what the other side of the coin is going to be, you know, in the process. So yeah, the, the, uh, the, the wait and see, uh, or the watch, the watch, the sorry, watch. the watch. So do you want seems... to amend your motion to watch? And then we bring this as a formal watch position to the board. Okay. It's up to you. I think we can move on. We, Do you have enough direction? We, need we have one public comment. We got a first and a second. I don't think we vote on it though, right? Yeah. No, no vote. Yeah. Here. Okay. okay. Um, um, 7713. I'll go ahead and unmute you. Hello. Hi, this is Mimi Willard calling in. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, SB 23 and I uh, hope you'll indulge me a, a couple other things because there were technical problems with my being able to access the uh, items not on the agenda. Um, so uh, SB 23, I think, uh, sounds like a very important opportunity for the district. And um, I hope that you will uh, continue to take whatever actions are necessary to um, in, ensure its uh, success. Um, and what you do as far as the strategy of getting there, I, I defer to the board. Uh, I also want to um, 
to give my kudos to Director Schmidt for recusing him from this item. Uh, other things I wanted to talk about briefly. Number one, we have the Prop 218 notices coming out, which undoubtedly comply with the law detailing the rates and explaining the need. Um, that said, um, uh, there's, I think, a little bit of messaging that needs to be done here because the IJ has now twice, um, I think, significantly understated that the rate hikes will be, quote, up to 20 percent, unquote. And um, by the numbers that we have done, we think that that would be, in fact, around 30 percent for a typical customer in the first year and um, 70 percent over the course of the four year cycle. We would be happy to be wrong about that. Uh, we haven't seen official numbers from the water district. And I think it's important for the district to ensure that people don't don't uh, just look at the Prop 218 notice, but understand what the significance is for them. Um, secondly, uh, I would like to encourage the district to post their PowerPoint sooner for the digestion of both the board and the public prior to meetings such as this one. Um, thirdly, dual notice meetings and payments for them. I applaud the fact that you are looking today about at potentially changing the board guidelines to uh, eliminate that and turn the meetings such as the finance committee meeting into just a standing committee meeting with two members of the board uh, able to sit at the dais and um, um, make decisions. Um, fourthly, the um, timing of board officer elections. I think what needs to happen here is that these need to be done in even years. And that way, when you get a new member on the board, in fact, the whole board is able to discuss the, the, the um, necessity for the rates, the magnitude of the rates with a good long ramp that starts in the fall of the even numbered year and culminates in the new rates being set in the odd number year. So um, if, for example, in the current rate cycle, you went for only three years of increases and came back three years from now with a new rate cycle, say a four-year cycle, thank um, you, you would Miller. then. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, I think we're moving on to item number three. Afternoon, board members. Uh, Matt Segas, the grant and legislative coordinator for the district. Uh, today's staff is requesting the finance committee review and refer to a regular bi-monthly meeting of the board of directors committee, a position of support on assembly bill 40. AB 40 from assembly member ward of San Diego. 30. AB 30, yeah. I'm sorry, AB 30. Uh, from assembly member ward of San Diego would expand the DWR Atmosphere, uh, atmospheric rivers program to include forecast informed reservoir operations or FIRO and integrate FIRO into DWR water supply operations and flood and hazard risk mitigation efforts. The bill would also advance DWR's atmospheric river forecast capabilities and include refined climate projections from for various environmental conditions. Uh, the bill has the strong support from Sonoma Water and is formally supported by Aqua. Uh, with the recent placement of advanced weather instrumentation on Mount Barnaby, and as a contractor to Cinema Water, the district stands to benefit from FIRO-based integration proposed by AB 30. For these reasons, staff recommends the Finance Committee review and refer to a regular bi-monthly meeting of the Board of Directors Committee, a position of support on this bill as defined in attachment to. Thank you. Thank you. Comments, Matt? Thank you for that. Um, I think the science behind the, the concept of FIRO is very strong. I think it makes sense. And I think um, we're going to start seeing it all across the state, if not the rest of the country, as we as we move through these um, changing climate patterns to get these big downpours of water. So I think it's good. Um, on the last section of the, the bill actually says the department shall take actions within its existing authority to operate or should take all actions with, within its existing authority to operate reservoirs in a manner. And then it goes on. My only concern is that they'll have a little bit more control over the, the release of water than what we currently see now. And so I would say I support it, but I just want to make sure we're, we're maintaining the fact that this is not going to affect um, environmental flows uh, that are currently um, out there right now. So that's my only, only concern, but I'd like to support it. Thank you. 
you know, I, I think for a while now, we've been hearing about how better data and better analytical methods are going to improve water services generally. I would argue that FIRO is probably the most striking example of how we're going to be moving forward technically to improve our water uh, supplies. Um, it's, it's an, um, you know, um, Matt noted that this might be a program that extends across the country at some point. I'm going to argue that what's happening here in Northern California is going to be taken up globally. It's really an impressive effort from my perspective. I, I support this really strongly. I also acknowledge um, um, Matt's comment regarding the uh, control of releases. Larry, any comments? With me, man. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm supportive as well. And I just want to give a shout out to our representative, Damon Conley, who's a co-author of this bill. And and I, uh, I, I motion that we, that we move forward supporting it to the staff. Second. Terrific. I think you're all. Yep. No, there is no public comment on this. Thank you. Yeah, we'll get, yeah, we'll get money back in there. The hot seat. All right, Monty's back in the room, and we're going to be moving on to item four on our agenda, which is a review of policy and practices updates with our general counsel, Molly. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, so good afternoon. Um, I'm Molly McLean, general counsel for Marin Municipal, and um, I know that um, there's a lot to unpack in this presentation today. So we're just gonna take it step by step. And really the majority of these items are cleanup items, housekeeping items. So even though there's a lot there, um, for the most part, um, those items for review and refer are a really logistic um, cleanup items. And so I think as we walk through it, hopefully that'll become apparent. So um, we're gonna cover today um, a timing of board officer elections and the setting of board calendar um, to try and um, clarify some inconsistencies that we've encountered, an update to the general manager and risk management committee settlement authority, um, dual notice for committee slash special board meetings, and a couple of po board policies that we want to update. So that's our reserve policy and our ADA grievance policy. And then we're going to consider whether or not there's an interest in moving forward with a legislative advocacy policy, given where we were just um, um, at with uh, some of that discussion. So first off, the election of board officers and um, setting a board calendar. So we're going to start with the water code. The water code section uh, 71253, which is specific to um, municipal water districts, um, was changed actually in 2013. I don't know why, um, to say that the, the newly directed or newly elected directors should take um, office the first Friday in December. It used to say beginning of January, um, Larry you may recall. Uh, and, and so that, um, also there's a, um, consideration that, that sort of, uh, uh, intersects that, which of course is the certification of the election results by our County Registrar of Voters. Um, so I think in this past, um, election, we, we did have a little, um, inconsistency there. We had the water code section directive and we had, um, uh, the registrar of voters or the county um, election officers have 30 days from the election date to certify the election results. So we had a little bit of a delay. I think we just want to look at clarifying that. We also have a district code section that talks about election of board officers, the first meeting in January. So if we're seating newly elected directors in December, it's possible that we would have a gap in our officers. Um, in the event, not 
every time, of course. But in the event, one of the officers was actually on the slate for election. Um, we, we, you know, just could encounter something like that. So something to consider. Um, lastly, the board handbook provides for setting a board calendar by January 31st each year. And um, I think we also saw that there was a little bit of a, um, a need to kind of bridge a gap there in January to make sure we knew which meetings we were going to proceed with because we didn't yet have a board calendar adopted. And I think we could consider whether or not to bring that forward to the board a little earlier in the process so that we might actually have a board calendar at the beginning of the year. So with that, some um, proposed realignments with the water code and other of these timing issues. Um, so what we're proposing for review and refer to the regular board meeting today is to clarify the time um, for taking office. So we can't change the water code, nor are we going to change the time for certification of election results. So we just want to be clear, what are we going to do if we have this conflict? And we could put that in our board policy, um, in our board handbook, and identify that we will do our best to comply with the water code requirement for the first Friday in December, but we are not going to um, seat our new directors until election results have been certified. I think that's an important comment. Why don't we just move that meeting? I mean, there's only one meeting in December because of the conflict with Christmas. So why don't we just move the meeting from the first week to time that accommodates this register? Well, Larry, the, the water code is very specific about the first Friday in December. And and we, we you know, that's not always in, in conjunction with the board meeting. So we, we definitely could do it at the first meeting in December. We could we could look at the board calendar. How can we best position that meeting in December? Because you're correct. We typically only have one regular board meeting in December. Um, but we'd still want to clarify that we're not going to seat um, newly elected officers the first Friday in December if we don't have election results certified by that date. Of course. And then we that could definitely, sense. you know, um, if, if, for example, as happened this last time, we had the first Friday pass, even though we were geared up and ready to go with newly elected officers, um, we didn't have the certification results and we were left in a little bit of a, you know, staff needing to, to make the call of what, what's the appropriate thing to do. And we decided, well, we don't have the certified election results. So let's wait till that first meeting in December. And that's, that is how it happened. Um, and just be good to codify in the policy, um, that approach, I think. Um, similarly for the, the election of board officers, what we're proposing is that in an election or immediately following an election cycle, that the board officer elections could take place at that first meeting in December after the newly elected officers have been um, sworn in to take office so that we wouldn't there wouldn't be any lag and we wouldn't be scrambling or wondering what do we do if our board president or vice president was actually um, on the election um, uh, for that year and we were suddenly found without a president. We, we could figure it out, but these are good things to think of ahead of time so we have a policy that's clear. Um, and so um, we wouldn't need to do that in, in um, elections not following, or I'm sorry, in board elections not following an election result. We could still do it the first meeting in January, of course, because we don't have that issue of potentially losing um, one of our officers. Um, and lastly is the board calendar. And this is just kind of an indicator to staff to let's bring it to the board maybe in December and start looking at it. And of course, if we did have newly elected directors coming on board, we'd want to make sure that they got to weigh in. So we would um, do that only after the, the um, taking of office. Um, but it would allow us, I think, to get a little bit of a jump on the next year's calendar and, and not be scrambling. So those are just cleanup items. They're not earth shattering. It, it seems to me that the secretary could bring that calendar forward because really there's very little modification year to year except for things like the december the reason the one meeting in december isn't just christmas it's also because of aqua yes. meeting in that first week which wipes out the first week's meeting so that i don't know how much aqua moves that around a, 
a little, but you're right. And 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 it would be um this would be a direction to our board secretary to sort of look at those. There's some holidays also um with our committee meetings. There's some um end of the year finance issues that then you know usually have us skipping one of the finance meetings um, mid-year fiscal fiscal year to allow them to do um, close their books. So things like that are taken into account and Terry does a great job. It's just, um, you know, letting her know that the board might be interested in seeing that a little bit sooner than the first meeting in January. Yeah, no, I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, that, that's always been an awkward situation right. as, as is the setting of committees. That's another yes. whole issue that's very complex because you don't know who to talk to until you know who to talk to. Yes. So, you know, it's not like it doesn't exist until it exists. But there's one more thing, and I'm not sure this is the format to bring mm -hmm. it up, but I'm going to bring it up anyway. And okay. Stop me if you don't want it. <laughs> um, I've been talking to a number of folks in city councils and uh, school boards. All of them have training for new board members uniformly, every mm -hmm. single one. Mm -hmm. They are shocked when I tell them that there's no training on our end? Well, I wouldn't say there's no training. I would say formal training. Formal training. We do meet um, and have an orientation for each of our newly elected yeah, but directors. What they actually do in these trainings is mm -hmm. they expose them to things like yeah. television interviews right? with TVs, with cameras. Oh, they, they actually, the boot camp. I like it. <laughs> and they do it across the board. Mm -hmm. Uh, the folks I've spoken to, uh, literally their jaw drops when I tell them we do essentially nothing formal. I understand you do the briefing, but in yes. terms of actual briefings of how to handle yourself in the public, what to do about the public, what to do about positions, mm -hmm. what does it mean to vote yes? What does it mean to vote no? What does it mean when you have a question? <clears throat> and I think we need to do that normally it's not much of an issue because you have one new board member and four old ones and that kind of integrates. But the situation we're in with one experienced board member and four or three and a half new ones um, is hard. And Monty's been in a box because of COVID. You know, I mean, uh, only recently you've ever even seen the public. You didn't even know they existed except you see them on a Zoom screen. And, you know, like I say, I, I don't know if this is the time to bring it up, but it's up. Well, so. I think it's it's food for thought. And I think, you know, we can take it back and staff can talk about whether there are other components that would be helpful to the board. So I think it's good feedback for us to hear. Yeah. Is this yeah. time you want feedback on this item? Um, we can certainly do that. And yeah. and then we'll go through the next one. Next one? Yeah, okay. let's yeah. do that. Matt? <clears throat> um, I Nothing further. I think it makes sense. I just want to make sure we, we don't try to bite off too much in one month for that. Um, and that mm -hmm. the committee members or committee chairs would be chosen prior to the finalization of the, the calendar for the year. I'm sorry. And just a clarification, would there be an interest? You're saying there's an interest to choose the committee members prior or, or but well, that wasn't on the, our, our list, the committee. Appointments. Right. And I think that's the part that for me, it makes sense um, with the calendar. So that okay. way the committee chairs can take a look at the calendar okay. for that year. Okay. Good point. Okay. No further comment. Um, I, I think there's, these are great cleanups. So thanks, Molly, for, for bringing this in. And um, we have been through a very unusual time period. Yeah. And I think each of the board members uh, that are here and in the past come in with a lot of experience. And, and I think generally, if you've gotten elected, you know how to talk to the public and work with the public, but I do think that the board decorum and um, and the Brown Act and many other facets of of being on a publicly elected board are, are worthy of a training. So I, I think that Director Russell is making a, a good suggestion. Um, I do think that, uh, that in dealing with the calendar, I think that if we, when we set the calendar, we might um, go ahead and set the calendar into the following January just to deal with the fact that we may have a delay in setting the calendar. So it's a small thing, but I think if we, if we, instead of having the calendar end on the end of the calendar year, have it spill over to the following January, that would just cover, create a little bit more coverage in that, in that in between time, just a thought. Yeah. Um, I guess the first item I'd like to do is is make a motion that 
um, the board members come up with a list of policies and uh, procedural changes uh, for the staff to consider. And that the ones that you brought forward, I think, are great. And I'm glad you brought them forward. And so, um, but I think we can have a much more detailed review of of the whole thing. And so this is, a, a, to me, a subset. And if there's a second, then maybe we can have his homework to bring to you at a, at a, at a future board meeting, uh, a, a, a policy review with our own recommendations of other things to add. Well, I would, I would suggest that if um, any of the board members have ideas or suggestions, please feel free to send those to me throughout the year. And I will um, be happy to take a look at them and, you know, okay. kind of, I keep a running list of things that we can work on cleaning up. And this is just the current list that I have for right. this. So maybe we have a motion. The motion would be to, to have a specific meeting set aside to review uh, suggestions from the board on on policies. That's my motion. I mean, I think we can do it without a motion, but if there's because there's not an agendized item on that today, okay. but I can take that direction back. And... Okay, I, I I support what you're suggesting here, okay. all of it. I think it's very thoughtful. Uh, I agree with the idea of adding training, formal training. I could have used it, and I think it'd be beneficial. I'm sure others could as well. So thank you, Larry. And I am supportive, uh, Matt, of your idea to have committee uh, committee chairs be uh, chosen before the calendar is set, um, especially given some of the the next proposal that we're considering on on how committees uh, meetings will take place. That chair, it's going to be really important that they're in the meeting, one way or another. So that would be my two changes to your item here. Okay. to go to the board. Thanks for the feedback. So we, I do have at the end of the review and refers formal formality and if we'll need to get there, but um, yes. I, I just wanted to um, <clears throat> see if there was interest. I thought it was a, a creative idea that President Schmidt brought up of the board calendar could go from February through the following January going forward. So we, it's just a way to get out of this. Um, we have no meetings scheduled in January during this time period. So I, I thought it was kind of clever and creative and why not do that? I, I don't see why we couldn't have a standing calendar, very frankly, uh, with things like Rosh Hashanah and moving stuff around for certain holidays that needs to be looked at in advance. But we do have to, the board does have to adopt a formal annual calendar. Sure. But why couldn't it be in draft to start with? Right. You know, because, I mean, it's not like we're going to create more Tuesdays or, you know, th there's nothing earth shaking that's going to change. And um, overall, you know, so maybe we could have a, like a skeleton calendar that kind of sits there just to be adopted as opposed to something we seem to generate in the in the time between this uh, December meeting and the, the next meeting? Well, I think we do, you know, at least my understanding of the practice, and Terry or Adrian can correct me if I'm wrong or jump in, um, but I think we do um, consider our existing date structure, our sort of, you know, standing calendar. There's some slight modifications that we are, you know, interested in having the board members weigh in on as far as holidays and specifics. I know there was some discussion this year on some of those, but Adrian, you, you turned your mic on. Yeah, I'll just say in working closely with the board secretary on the calendar for this year, it was made a little bit more complicated because of some of the things that we had going on at the time. And we were trying to schedule a number of special meetings in advance for the strategic water supply assessment, as well as for rate setting on our Tuesdays that we don't normally have board meetings. Um, and so there was some additional coordination on that. So um, and speak, you know, whatever's going on at that time of year, we may be looking to advance calendar some of those items. And so um, the, the practice and, and what we follow um, is important for that purpose and so that uh, board members can plan ahead. And so we're giving the public um, proper noticing in advance of those important meetings. I mean, this is the logistics of calendaring um, are, are notorious. So right. the fact that it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important conversation because obviously we want to make it easy for the public to, to um, plan and attend. 
And, um, you know, as we get to the end of the calendar year, you know, everybody's already looking into the following year. So maybe a, 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 a blended suggestion um, with Director Russell, which is, you know, it seems to me we could have a, you know, a document on our calendar. We can have our board adopted calendar that I, I recognize as being something that we must have up there. But it might also be really helpful to have a what is a draft calendar of the following year which are just simply plugging in what our regular scheduled process is but it's still draft because it's not formally adopted but it could allow somebody who's planning that trip to hawaii or something like that or or you know wherever um you know in november to go oh but i really want to attend that board meeting in may and and know roughly when it's going to be so that might help kind of address that yeah so Oh, sorry. I'm sure. just watching the clock here. So yeah, um, I, I'm happy to do it either way. But I'm 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 hearing that we do want to move forward with this slate. So I'll I'll, I'll take well. We can take it up more at the end with any details as well. So I'm going to move right. move to the next item. Yeah. Okay. So the next item is update <clears throat> the general manager and the um, risk management committee settlement authority. Um, so we currently do have. Um, delegation of authority to our general manager to settle liability claims and workers' compensation claims. It's $20,000 limit. Um, it was adopted some time ago, I think 2003 and 2006. Um, and we're looking at updating and clarifying that authority um, so that it incorporates and includes pending litigation. So sometimes there are um, liability claims. There is a requirement that claims are filed before from most um, actions that claims are filed before a litigation would be um, filed in court. Um, so oftentimes we've seen those claims, we might have denied them for some reason, um, and then they pop up as litigation, they're small. Um, so this is, this is really just an a, a, you know, organizational efficiency item to um, uh, allow staff to move more quickly um, with some of these smaller items, and this is all with input and evaluation from the general counsel's office. So um, that is the proposal, and we're also looking at, because this was done so many years ago, bringing up the amount to something um, that's a little higher um, most of the smaller claims would fall under this window and any larger ones would of course come to the board. Most of these, most or the vast majority of these claims are generally attributed to line breaks and flooding damage. Some landslides, it's always, yeah, related Occasionally to Occasionally there's some yeah. bigger stuff, but generally these small ones are dealing with damage to the basement or damage to cars from mm -hmm breaks in line and it gets reviewed and back and forth and there's a settlement. Yeah, and we also work with our third party administrator to make sure we have the appropriate documentation for claims when they're submitted. Great. Any board comments? Uh, the only one would be, is this uh, is this limit enough or does it make sense to go a little bit higher considering it was 2006 when it was last reviewed? <laughs> Well, I think that's a good point. I have seen, um, you know, uh, settlement authority up to 50,000, but I wanted to move incrementally. Um, so it's really within the discretion of the board and what their comfort level is. Um, I think 25,000 is a reasonable amount. Um, it could go up higher if there's an interest, I would say maybe go up to 30 at this point and not make a huge jump all at one time. Um, Molly, the just maybe if you know if if you think twenty five thousand thirty thousand will cover most of the claims, I do. Then I think you know that that seems reasonable. Okay. I'll just say I think so too. Let's just make it easy to do the regular business. I do want to make sure that we have a chance to learn about these things, just so mm -hmm. that um, that we're aware. But you know, do, so I'm, that's. I, a, Sorry, I think that's an excellent point. And I do incorporate these into my quarterly report from the general counsel's office to the board. So all of those are available for the board to see the, all of the claims activity. Okay, that might be, I mean, the finance administration committee might also be a place to, to have those reviewed to, I don't know, in more real time rather than waiting quarterly. I don't know, but that might be another consideration. Something to think about, but I, I, you know, we can, we can, I don't know if it's really something we'd want to do in a, in a public setting like this. Okay. But, um, I'm good with your recommendation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And quarterly is good enough for me to review these, these claims. 
Me too. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. One other piece of this that, that I didn't get to yet, and that's real quick. The risk management committee is made up of our senior leadership team or some small subset of that. And they do have authority right now up to 2,500. I would increase that to 5,000. So that takes a little bit of the weight off of the um, general manager. And the again, the general counsel's office does evaluate all of these with our third party administrator. Okay. Sounds good. All right, so now we're on to um, one of our favorite topics, and this is just here for, it's not a review and refer item, it's just here for discussion because there was a discussion earlier in January on this item. Um, there were some questions from the board, and also I heard a request to bring this back in March after we've had some time to um, settle in and let the board, um, you know, experience some of these committee meetings and some of our board meetings. And so I'm back um, with a little bit of history on this. Um, and um, this has been a longstanding practice here at the district, um, at least as far as I could find back, at least as far as 2006. I don't know if, if um, Director Russell has any more information on that. No, I there... go back to 2004. So okay, <laughs> so maybe even longer. Uh, that, I don't remember why it yeah. happened, but it was a a practical. Sure. Decision. And that's right. And um, so what it means is we duly notice our committee meetings as special board meetings as well, so that all of you can attend and participate in those discussions. Um, so um, pursuant to our board um, handbook, we typically don't take action at those meetings. Um, and doesn't allow, like I said, it doesn't allow a quorum to attend and to participate. Um, but it is an I would say very uncommon practice for public agencies to have duly noticed committee meetings on a regular basis that would include the entire board. I think also um, it can sometimes be confusing to members of the public, just what's happening here? Is this a committee meeting or is it a board meeting? Why is there a chair instead of our president running the meeting? Are there really you know, decisions being made or are they not? We try to be careful with review and refer and follow our board policy and our board handbook on that. Um, but, but, there, but there have been issues raised. So this is just a point um, at which we can stop. And I want to hear from our board is if there's an interest to um, you know, really look at this or bring something forward or um, a couple of options that I've thought of is, you know, a trial period for um, just noticing meetings as committee meetings to see what that feels like. We've we've experienced our duly noticed meetings. Maybe we want to give it a try and see how it goes. Alternatively, we can continue this practice um, indefinitely or maybe revisit it again later in the year. So those are just some options for, for you to think through. Yeah, I think it, I don't know they understand what that option means. Um, before this practice, um, the two of us that are not on the committee would, there are others of us, would have to sit out in the audience. That's what it means. Yes, that's so right. So it means you're, you can participate as a public member, but not as a board member. So when you speak, you speak for yourself, not for the board or for the district. And so, so you can provide comment at, at, during the public comment period. You can, you but only as an individual Okay. It's awkward. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty unusual. I think at a, a water district to have uh, one of the board members have a, a personal matter in front of the board. It happens sometimes, for example, in, um, you know, planning commission subcommittees or something like that, where there might be a property involved. And then that person, even though they're on a, a public board still has their first amendment rights to make public comment, but typically a board member who attended, who's not on the committee would just observe um, and not participate. Or we do still have hybrid options. So they could watch the meeting live. Or of course, it's recorded. You could watch it later. So there are those, all of those options exist. Any comments? We'll go around the horn. I'll kick it off again yep. here. Um, I think with it going back to 2006, I think it's become an institutionalized practice. And so my concern with... Um, peeling the Band-Aid off right away is that the way the staff is used to working and the way the processes are, are used to going, that it would be much more difficult. And I think some of the unintended consequences mean that the regular scheduled board meetings will be considerably longer um, as we have more discussion on a lot of these items potentially too. So I think looking at it holistically, but at the same time, I think you know, sit 
around here with some very intelligent folks I'm, I feel very fortunate for serving with. And I think um, those folks being able to lead those board meetings or those committee meetings, excuse me, um, and then taking back their consideration from the referrals from the committees makes a lot of sense too. Um, but then again, at the same time, we we walked in, we we entered this board with a lot of a lot of things going on. And so this committee practice of us attending and dual noticing has been an excellent learning experience and an opportunity to gain quite a bit in a very short amount of time. So I definitely value that as well. So I think for me, I'd like to um, continue along this process, at least till we get through the rate setting price uh, process um, and the water supply piece moving forward into the summer months and then revisit next fiscal year would be my recommendation. Good comments. Um, you know, I, 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 I was previously on a public board for six years where we had standard committee meetings. So I did find this very unusual to come into. Um, I really do appreciate the learning that this has provided, the, the dual noticing, um, but I've also in the past really benefited from the efficiency of committee meetings that come back to the full board with reports and recommendations. That's an efficiency that I think exists for board and staff, um, I'm imagining. Uh, so it's something I would really be in favor of going back to at some point. I certainly appreciate Matt's perspective, though, that getting through some of the big items that are in front of us uh, and being able to discuss those in multiple venues is beneficial. So I guess I'm leaning towards a, you know, let's bring this up again, but I think when we do, I will be probably more keen to see us go back to regular committee meetings. Which we'll keep going in a row. In a row. This is a practice Good that, with you, that. that you've developed yeah. here. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I back when we for, talked about this last, I was pretty vocal. I think then about the um, informational value for all the new members to be able to sit up here and be part of this conversation. The, we are having that conversation right now. This wouldn't in, in a regular in the committee meeting of the format that we're talking about and going back to, we would not be having this. It would be Jed and I sitting up here. And if you folks were here, you'd be sitting in the in the back. And 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 I I can't help but thinking that that wouldn't be inferior to a, a, a conversation that that really does affect all of us, you know, and and so hence would be I'm appreciating being able to hear what folks have to say. Um I, you know, I, I didn't realize the practice went back that far, um, but that there it is. And I, and I am cognizant of the impact of to staff. And so I'd like to hear about how the dual noticing, if it does have a substantial um, impact on staff time and effort, because that would be meaningful. But I, I, I'll just, and I'll just say this so to keep going. Mm -hmm on time um, is that I, I do think that we have a lot going on right now. And I would, I would be in favor of continuing this practice for, um, for a defined period and to come back maybe the summer, you know, after we get past a number of things, because I think we just have so much going on right now that, um, that this really, I think it benefits the public, frankly, to have, again, this much um, communication and dialogue among board members to learn about the issues. Did you want to say something, Ben? Yeah, I, I was just going to respond to President Schmidt that, um, you know, we've thought about it. I, I don't think there's a significant workload distinction between the two. We still have to put the material together. I think more from my experience that if we went back to committees, there could be value in traditional committees of more of working sessions and less formality. Not that we couldn't do it under this model, but just in my experience, it, it leads to that, which is a nice opportunity of less formality and more of kind of working session committees. Um, but, but how I, how are we not doing that now? I guess right, that, that, I, I guess that's, I, I, I hear point. you. I like getting work done when we when people are have made the effort to be here and any of us, including staff. But are we? Is it is it impeding us doing I, doing the work that you're referring to? I can to? put my finger on. I just say there's a distinction of one I've seen. The traditional committees they've had a less formal and more of a working session. Not that if we maintain this, we couldn't think about it and strive for what that would look like and mean. 
it's just it's just different in in a way that's hard to precisely put my finger on. Well, and if, if I may, Chair Smith, my experience with the, the committees versus the, the special board meetings, which is really what we're having, um, is just, um, it is a different flavor. Um, there are only two, um, in this case, um, members of the board. So there's, you know, more room for the two who are here to really have a dialogue with staff on some of these issues. And then I think it really is incumbent upon the staff at the committees to bring back those discussions and really fully, you know, explain, make recommendations to the board. Here, we really don't have recommendations going to the full board because I think that would be very confusing, you know, are we, you know, again, that taking action versus, you know, recommendation from the full board to the board is a little awkward. So I personally have struggled with how do we walk that, you know, line to try to really have those actions taken at a full a full board meeting, a regular board meeting. Um, so I think that it, it is, there's distinctions. It's, it really is discretionary. I mean, there's probably pros and cons on both sides, honestly. Uh, Larry, any other comments? Uh, only one. Uh, now I'm a little confused. Mm -hmm. um, so if we had the normal committee, but we have the Zoom, mm -hmm. that means that we can watch it without notice of where we are. So yes, all of, I mean, in the board, any of the board members who are not on the committee sure, certainly could watch it um, live um, just like you could but in the audience. Notice. Without notice. Can I just say you would be participating yeah. as an attendee, like our attendees yeah. that are on from the public. Right? That's what we're doing anyway. But you wouldn't be visible. Yeah. So you wouldn't be getting. Oh, that's true. Your you wouldn't be on the panel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, but we couldn't participate. If, if it was just a committee, there wouldn't be participation from the other. That that's right. I'm sorry. So yes, that's the point. If your point is that, can you join the Zoom and watch just like everybody else at the time? Of course. The and question was about notice. Yes. And we don't have to notice where we are. That's correct. To, to, observe it that's correct it, it, i suppose it's just like watching it after hours so in a sure. yep but there's but you could have public but you could comment as it, if you're joining via zoom would you be able to, to i would I, you know i think that It'd i would be recommended not to do it unless that it's a practice yeah. um unless it was an a personal you know your own personal item but i think as a board member you have kind of a higher standard of you know are you, why are we talking about a, you know, water service connection that, you know, that's personal to you, really that specifically personal, not just your opinion. So th that's an important public. difference if you were to yes. participate via that's Zoom. I mean, I, I think we'd have to figure that out as a, you know, yeah. a, a, how to make, how to have a clear definition about, about how we would participate or not. Yes. And I'd be happy to help with that. And re remember that the committee meetings are then advisory, you know, recommending actions mm -hmm. to the full board mm -hmm. and the full board would have the opportunity that you and then you would have as a board member the opportunity to discuss mm -hmm. right. but I, I think the comment that was made is right on that in the situation we are in i think mm -hmm. a full attendance of these committee meetings is absolutely essential and i thank you all for adjusting your schedules to do that because there's no other way to understand what's going on you know getting as nice as terry is to produce the summaries a, a, a two sentence or two paragraph summary of an hour or two hour meeting obviously doesn't cut it in terms of bringing the people up to speed. So the only way to get really up to speed is the best is to be here, participate. The next would be to watch it and at least absorb it. But these are about as fun as watching paint dry. So they're kind of hard, at least I find kind of hard to stay. I won't, I won't take that personally. <laughs> Well, they're not all that way, but <laughs> many times it's that way, especially when it's not live. Right. It's not really interactive. You know, it's just, it's, it's like watching any of their YouTube. Understood. Shows. Understood. Well, I, I um, for one, tend to have an opinion on almost everything. And so you got five people <laughs> around that, that have thoughts and opinions. I can see why it can be laborious and we're experiencing it now because we're at least a half hour over time, and we all have lots to say. On the other hand, I'm learning from everybody, right? We're all here. We're having this discussion. And if we hadn't had it right now, 
then it would get put off to the next board meeting and then or never, we, we, or never, never. and we would have an enormous amount of work. And so um, the lens for which I tend to look at almost all of our decisions is why are we different? Right. Is there a reason why we're different than every other agency? And I'm, I'm not sure I can see why we would be different. Why would be the one of the only ones? Why is it uncommon to have uh, special board meetings as our committee meetings? And I don't really know that there's a reason. So so I, I think I would tend to probably do the normal practice. Uh, and it's just a matter of a timeline and when. So I see the benefit. We're learning from each other, and we're in a very intense period of time. So let's get through this time. Let's get through this rate setting process. There's a lot of decisions that haven't been made for a long time, and now's the time to make them. And so we need to get up to speed and move quickly. And I'd, I'd say summer would be the time to revisit it. So I, I, I'm I'm super appreciative. It, what it will do if we do go to only two board members at a committee meeting we'll put the onus on those two people to be super attentive, to do their homework and try to look out for everybody's thoughts and perspective and the public's. So that recommendation would have a lot more say and be a lot more meaningful, right? It, that that recommendation will come strong. And so that's putting two people with a, maybe a lot more say on it than maybe um, they normally would have. Uh, one thing to consider is to have certain committees be done that way and certain be more uh open to having special board meetings and I, I you know and i think we can talk about them in those committees but I, I do think finance and administration does tend to look across the entire organization and i kind of welcome everyone's input on it i'm not sure maybe communications and conservation may be one that we don't need everyone to attend or maybe watershed or maybe others so maybe the other committees can kind of talk about it in, in their meetings as well Okay, the only thing something. I'll say about that is there was a reason it was done in 2006. It, it wasn't casual. It wasn't arbitrary. Um, so let's find out why it was done, which which I can do, um, and then make any decisions about timing. I, I I would suggest because we don't have training that we do this for at least this year because I think that you guys need it. Okay, just to get as much information as you can, the easiest way. And I think this is the easiest way. Um, you know, if it doesn't work for your schedule, that's fine. Then pick up the information a different way. But this is invaluable, this open communication and learning as you go, because there's a lot to learn. Yeah. I, one, one suggestion to be considered from a policy perspective is that if if we do go to not dual noticing meetings and a board member attends but is in the audience and part of the public i do not believe they should be compensated for that so i think what i'm hearing is we will revisit this topic in july okay thanks everybody for your input it's been very um helpful i think all right, I'm going to keep moving. Um, so we're looking at um, some board policies. We have a res uh, board has a reserve policy. That's uh, policy number 46, um, and also an ADA policy, policy number 31. What we're proposing specific to the reserve policy is to review and refer to the next board meeting, uh, an update, a very streamlined update, and specifically. Um, we've heard from the board that we want to have a savings account or a reserve fund set aside for um, water supply resiliency projects. We want to add that to our reserve policy so it's consistent with the process that we're going through now in the rate setting and our cost of service analysis. And so that's what we're proposing in addition to some language cleanup items. There would be, as I'm told by our chief financial officer, a larger review um, and potential revision process later this year. This is just to make sure that we are in alignment with um, the current rate setting COSA process. So that's the reserve policy. Um, the ADA policy, um, we have a grievance policy. We need to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. This hasn't been updated for a little while, so we're due to make sure that we have an appropriate process and also named um, current ADA coordinators for the district so that the public who may have concerns um, or grievances or need accommodations knows who to contact the district to get that assistance that they're entitled to by law. So those are the two policies that are on the review and refer to the next board meeting. 
Um, the other item is just, again, for discussion, we did go just go through a legislative um, uh, position review for a couple of different pending le legislation. So um, it might be helpful to the board to actually have a process. And so we're looking at a le legislative advocacy position policy from the board. I think this could be fairly simple. Um, we do work closely with Aqua, as you've heard, the Association of California Water Agencies. They do monitor a lot of legislation and from time to time do request the board to weigh in and take a position. We would have the general manager as well as the legislative staff identify these opportunities and then have a, you know, discuss a process, bringing it first to a committee um, for review and referral to a full board. And then, you know, we have our position statements. We could um, just codify that in a policy if there's interest. So um, I'm going to jump to the end just to keep us moving. So the recommendations- Before you, before you I'm sorry, Molly. Yeah. Just, I don't know, know. We want to get through this. If you can go back. Yep. Um, just in terms of the, 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 I'm not sure I understand what the update is to follow the board policy 31. Is that that we need to, what is the action that needs to happen? So we just need to update that policy so it's consistent with the current Americans with Disability Act requirements and also update the named um, district coordinators by position, preferably as opposed to name, so that um, we have positions identified within the agency. Okay. So members of the public who who need to either file a grievance or even member even potentially um you know uh, ask for an accommodation have yeah. those names uh, appropriately available it. so it's just an update to that policy okay comments i, I just was gonna on the third bullet um i i think uh this would be a really good um policy for us to develop and i, I would like us to i don't know where we would talk about what that process would look like but that's a I think that, you know, when it comes to legislation, that's a very complex universe and there's a there's a whole legislative process and understanding where you are at the legislative process mm -hmm. when you're weighing in, how things can change mm -hmm. um, and b bills are amended rapidly as they get closer to being signed. So what you think you were behind may not be what it looks like um, a day or weeks later, mm -hmm. um, understanding the nuances of of impacts and and um and different um constituents that have differing opinions and and concerns that you may not have ever seen but others that have you know come from different backgrounds can see issues that impact them it's very tricky is i guess the part that i'm trying to really underscore i would in general unless the board unless there's a really a nexus with the legislation with the district i would i think the first question i would i would want to see in a process is what's the real nexus with with the district so that we're just not yeah. expending time on things that because it's not an easy thing to just be like that looks good we're going to sign on there's responsibilities and roles that you have ongoingly to keep tracking that bill and keep updating folks um, and understanding really the the, the a, a much deeper legislative analysis of the issues and concerns mm -hmm. so it's an I important task if we're going to take that mm -hmm. on thank you larry any comments on these mm -hmm. Matt, Ranji, just what you, you're not making any specific recommendation on what the language would be for the new reserve fund yet. Is that right? No, there's we're some not. in here, but I, oh, we're no. not. We're not making specific. We're just saying at we this need point. to create language that that will define how that new reserve fund will be spent. Correct. We're okay. just identifying the need to update the policy, and that that language change would be brought to the full board. Um, and there would be an opportunity to review the actual language Good before comment. there was action on that. Yes. Great. All set. Thank you very much. Okay. So with that, I think we've already covered these, but um, we do have recommendations for review and refer on the changes to the district code and handbook on timing of elections calendar, um, et cetera, update to the general managers and RMC um, settlement authority, an update to the reserve and ADA grievance policies. These were the consider and pride provide direction on, but I think that we covered that unless there's more from the board at this time. And I'm sure there might be public comment right here. There are none. Okay. Great. Up to the chair if there's nothing more. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Molly. All right. Moving on to our monthly financial report with our head of finance, Brett. Bet you've been on the edge of your seat watching this, huh? Mm -hmm. 
Call me nerdy, but I find myself riveted by these meetings. I'm I'm definitely awake. <laughs> Maybe you need a little more perspective. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't so much talking about the meeting as watching the YouTube. That's the hard part. It, I, I find it's just not interactive enough. It, it, it's like watching a TV show you're not really interested in. It's hard to get into it, you know? At least I find that. And everybody's so little too. All right, hopefully you can all see my screen. Uh, my name is Brett Uppendahl, I'm finance director for the district. Um, I have a brief update for you here today, uh, recognizing where we are on time and also recognizing that there's not a lot of change here in the material we've seen over the last uh, few board meetings or few finance committee meetings, I should say. So I'll walk you through this, happy to take any questions along the way. Um, revenues are the first um, set of data we look at each month. Um, as we've mentioned in the past, most of these are, are you know, online with the exception of our water revenues. I'll talk about that. And those are uh, have been lagging for the last 18 months or so. Other revenues there you see at 135, um, that just really reflects some grant revenues that have um, come in as we charge back for reimbursable work. So we don't always include um, budgeted grant or we don't always include grant revenues in our budget because we don't know when they're coming in. So we're just starting to see some of that work be completed um, and the reimbursements come through. Uh, fire flow is on par as is um, CMF revenue towards the bottom. So 63%. And I'll talk again, just to remind the board about why uh, we'd expect to be a little bit higher in water revenues at this time. This is the slide that shows our water revenues, uh, variable water sales on the left-hand side, uh, the fixed fees down the middle and on the right. Um, and what I would do is I would just point our board to the kind of you know uh, monthly budget actuals here within water sales, again, you know, ranging between 70s and you know mid 80% in terms of where we'd expect to be with the budget that was set two years ago. Uh, reflecting current demand levels and kind of ongoing conservation. So even though we are at 59%, um, you know, it says here in the bottom left, and that tracks closely to 66% on a fiscal basis, we actually are 17% behind our budget because we'd expect to be even higher at this time since we have the majority of the warm summer months behind us. So we're monitoring this, we're incorporating it. It's been a part of the rate setting you know, process and budget look, um, but we're still kind of maintaining this general track of mid 80s, uh, which translates to 83% um, of actuals on the year. Fixed fees here, 98% and 98% are much more in line with what we'd expect. Brett, I think I mentioned this last time, but if, if it's easy, if you can show this budget to actual and then actual to last year also, that'd be great. So we can just see historical numbers. Yeah, um, I have one slide that gets to that, um, um, but I don't have the numbers there per se, but this starts to show you kind of where we were um, in terms of in relationship to the budget, you know, last year that you know this is kind of a month by month plot. You, you can kind of see the divergence last year happening, you know, early in the fall, uh, and it's a pretty big divergence. It closed up a little bit towards the end of the year, but it really maintained or kind of you know uh, shortfall throughout the year. The current year, we saw a small divergence in the in the late fall as well, um, but nowhere near the magnitude of last year. So we're at seven million dollars behind budget and water loss now. Um, which is a better position than last year. And we're actually just crossed below that kind of million dollars per month threshold because we have eight months through the year now. And so we're actually getting closer and closer to the budget each month. I think this is maybe what you're more referring to, uh, Chair Smith, in terms of the actuals and you know actual to actual year over year. This is actually acre feet, not um, dollars. So it's, it's a better kind of year over year comparison as rates change each year, but uh, you can see that you know compared to last year, we're at 13.9 now compared to 12.9 last year. So that was an improvement from a financial perspective um, uh, that really kind of took hold last year after the good rains. Uh, however, you can see that it's still 20% behind or 22% behind fiscal 23. And when I did a 10-year average on this, it looks like we're about 15% behind our 10-year you know, average, which is you know, through February. So still in historically low territories in terms of overall water demand, um, but slightly better than last year. And sorry, Brett, so the 22% reduction from 21 to 23, 
15% lower than our 10 year average. And we're 17% below what was budgeted in terms of for revenue, water yeah, water revenues for the two year budget cycle. For the second year of the two year budget, second yeah. Second year of the, yeah. Okay, thanks. And so I mean, part of what you're saying there, you know, I think we got, you know, average consumption. I think we're all, you know, kind of aware of the changing demand patterns and weather patterns. Um, and then there's just, as we get consumption, there's change between the tiers too. So, you know, kind of hovering between that 15 to 20%, depending on, you know, individual, individual budget year, the tiers everyone's in and then overall consumption. So there's timing within the year and then, you know, within each billing period, frankly. But we're all within that 15 to 20% range. And that's what goes into the um, projections for the year. And I'll show you how that unfolds in, in the last slide here. Expenditures, again, we've been, you know, expected to be a little bit more linear here, 66% of the fiscal year. It's um, eight months out of 12. Personnel services has been lagging all year as we've maintained vacancies. Um, so that's the one item that, that really is lagging behind um, everything else. Capital allocation actually is related to that. Um, capital has been uh, reduced this year, as well as part of cost-cutting measures. Um, and, and a portion of that capital allocation is our staff that we budget or we allocate to capital projects. So again, that's in that 57% category um, due to some kind of one-time expenditure reductions this year. Um, fire flow projects and capital projects at the bottom, um, less linear, but now that we're getting towards the middle of the fiscal year, starting to kind of come uh, more in line with that 66% number. These do include encumbrances, so it's not all money spent out the door, projects completed, but it's you know contracts we've entered, in, entered into and other um, uh, money spent along the way. So again, all in line with what we expect to be, especially given the situation I think we're all aware of. Um, and so um, not much to really look at here other than to make sure these hold through for the next four months. So this is the projection slide, and this is kind of the more important slide of the entire uh, presentation today. Um, I, I think I mentioned about two months ago, we pulled off the 25% reduction in sales uh, number, as we realized that was not gonna be kind of in, in the realm of possibility. So now we're looking at two ranges between a 20% reduction and a 15% reduction. Um, and we're, we're really right in the middle of that right now. So um, it'll we'll have to inform that in the next two or three months as the rains pass and the warm weather returns. But for now, we're, we're right in the middle of that 20 and, and 15% uh, demand reduction uh, that has its impacts on water sales, as you can see. Um, on the expenditure lines, the estimated unbudgeted expenditures, uh, we have a savings um, in the personnel category, and that's due to our salary savings. Um, from vacancies and so that has has maintained right around that four million range it ticked a little bit higher this last month but um, we've, we've been seeing it right around that four million range all year which is just about a 10 percent savings rate um, and then we've taken off water purchases and sulahule pumping um, as we've had um, plenty of <laughs> rain in our watershed so we no longer uh, will be needing to, to import any additional water above the uh, contractual minimum uh, unfortunately though we are seeing paving costs continue to climb been discussed in a couple of different formats. Um, and so we've been updating those to, to really try to track the timing of when we're gonna incur those costs. And we have multi-year contracts and some overlap of operating and, and um, capital here, but I think we're feeling like 1.7 will be a, a pretty good number for over the budget or over the baseline this year. So they take the good with the personnel savings offset with the over um, expenditures and paving, and it's actually still a net savings on the expense side. So. Uh, water sales revenue loss of between nine and 12, um, expenditure, in this case, savings be, you know, right around 2.8, uh, yields us an operating loss in this case of between 6.3 and 9.4 million. And that's right here in the middle of the slide. And um, so that'll bring us down to about 18, between 18 and 20 million in fund balance and for unrestricted reserves. Uh, we are still planning to transfer over um, capital maintenance funds to cover debt service. So that should leave us, if you kind of compare the very top line up here, 27 to the bottom line, about 27, just about in a break-even year by using CMF to cover debt service. So um, that's good news, uh, certainly better news than we've had for, for the most part this year. Um, and, and it really is kind of a, a nice, you know, hopefully, you know, stepping stone or trajectory to take into uh, the next couple of years in terms of finances, at least here at the district. Um, and we'll get back to full speed, hopefully, sooner than later. Um, I do have one other slide here um, on our annual goals, and I'll go ahead and let Ben kick this one off. Yeah, so I just wanted to introduce a slide. This, um, from the last board meeting, there was a request to bring these goals that we talked about at the retreat and then reviewed them at the last board meeting to the committees for 
more discussion and of course ongoing tracking which we'll be doing so this is the first committee you know an example will be bringing the watershed goals to the watershed committee next month we'll be bringing as director smith noted the hr goals to this committee so we'll be doing that so um with that fred why don't you roll through yeah thank you ben and so um, ben shared our um, annual goals as you mentioned you know for each division um, at the last board meeting and i wanted to make sure that this committee had a chance to review mine uh, for the finance department and so there are three high level goals uh, the first one i think um, we've at least talked about half of that for a majority of the last few months which is the rate setting process by may 2023 the other half of that is the budget process and so we uh, behind the scenes are gearing up to be able to um, have some discussions on budget with the board here in the next uh, a month or two and so i think uh, we'll be setting some meetings uh, potentially a special workshop in april um, and then obviously bringing it back to a couple finance committee meetings so the board has a chance to really learn about the operating budget for each division um, as well as some of the kind of higher end you know revenue and expense projections now that we can begin to incorporate the uh, the rate setting uh, projections into this and we'll talk again to kind of reinforce what the um, uh, expenditure plan is for the board that we've laid out over the last uh, uh, few months here. So that'll be coming here in April and in May. Um, and then uh, pending board approval, those will be effective, both of them in July of 2023. Uh, the next major project, and I guess I should have said at the beginning of this, is these three goals, obviously, that, you know, are on top of kind of the day-to-day -day activities of finance and administrative division. Um, we're, you know, definitely doing more than this, but these are kind of the top um, three goals that are really kind of organization-wide and division-wide and helping move things forward. And so the second piece there is our water connection fee study. Um, we're going to start that in August. And I think we've touched on this at the board workshop again uh, and, and, and a few times, but I think the idea there is really to, to take a hard look at our current connection fees, which are one-time fees um, paid typically by um, new developments uh, to have access to our water system. And so uh, the last update was in 2018, um, and, and the current uh, connection fees are about $40,000 per acre foot, um, and then it depends on which area of the district uh, the proposed development would be in. Uh, each area has, under the current study, um, a kind of an assigned estimated acre foot usage per parcel. Uh, I think on average it's about a quarter um, of an acre foot or actually 0.3 acre feet um, per um, parcel. And so a typical connection fee this year would be about 13,000 or about $14,000 now. Um, but there is a range that goes all the way up to two acre feet per uh, service area. So there's a range, um, but the average is about $14,000. Uh, for multifamily units, um, it's a smaller uh, expected use of 0.14 acre feet per unit. And so those are all the things that we would undertake with, with a consultant to kind of really truth test that. Is that still what we're seeing? These were based on demand you know, data from the, the mid you know, 20 teens or so as it was updated in 2018. So as we've seen in the rate study, we've had a big change in demand levels and in cost. Um, and then I think one of the one of the concepts we'll be exploring here is whether we maintain our um, our buy-in uh, methodology, which is typically applied to uh, built-out uh, communities that don't have much expansion, or then we'll take a look at the other uh, options available to us, which is would be incremental cost approach and or the kind of the net zero um, you know, type approach on our water system. So we'll take a look at the pros and cons of each of those um, and map that out for the board. Uh, and for your consideration. Um, and as it shows here, the target completion date would be April of 2024. So it'd be about a six month effort with some a lot of data at the beginning to go through. And then finally, um, we'll bring our financial policies um, to the board here in, by December of next year and probably in pieces up to December. Uh, Molly just mentioned uh, the update of the reserve policy, which would mean to include the water supply reserve um, as part of the uh, rate setting process. We also need to um, bring a more full discussion on all of the levels of reserves we talked about throughout the, the rate setting. Um, so we're going to go through the, the current process with our current targets and then kind of discuss on a risk basis um, how to set those better for the long term. We'll also look at our debt management policy, investment policy, and our procurement policies um, probably in successive months throughout the, throughout the fall. Uh, so with that, I'm, I'm happy to take, actually, let me just get my summary slide here. Um, summary slide again, financial challenges continue. Water sales are below 23 budget. Um, pavement projects are impacting our reserves. Uh, our rain, the rainfall has been good news for us, reducing our expect, expected use of reserves, and especially with our savings on any additional um, water purchases or pumping. Uh, we are taking action still to reduce expenditures in the short term. Um, and then you know, longer term balancing options are, will still be at play if needed. 
Um, and, and within my department, the finance department, our goals are, are water rates, a two-year budget, connection fees, and policy updates. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back to the board for any questions. Comments? Brett, just a couple of questions, maybe. You know, it's, it's, it's no surprise to any of us, but it's still striking, at least to me, to see how sensitive our um, financial picture is to both demand for water as well as rainfall. It's no surprise, but it does lead me to ask, um, in our uh, forecast over the next four years, which you've presented to us multiple times, our financial model basically for the next four years, have you done any sensitivity analysis with respect to different levels of demand? I know you've been you know, working with your best assumptions on what demand is going to how it's going to track over the next mm -hmm. four years. If demand, if we are, you know, conservation programs are very fruitful, then we're potentially below those levels. Have we done any of that sensitivity analysis to see if we're, you know, where we might head into, uh, you know, negative territory again? So um, I don't have the specific numbers in front of me. Um, I think, you know, as you kind of alluded to, it's it's relatively straightforward. I mean, it's, it's we're highly sensitive. Um, I, I think um, I, I can bring that definitely as part of the, you know, more formally as part of the budget process, you know, as we look at that. I think, you know, just more anecdotally, what I would say is, you know, we're in a better position now than we thought we were six months ago in terms of reserves. So the short-term risk is probably shorter, right? Um, or the short-term risk is probably less than it would have been you know, six months ago because we have reserves enough to buffer us through probably one more year. Um, the hard part is is that, that the model that we're proposing you know really shifts pretty significantly from you know, high fixed fees into almost more lower fixed fees, and so that will increase yeah. our sensitivities going forward. And I think in addition to that, you know, when exactly the reason we went the other way. Yes. Yeah. So it, it, there's a balance and there's a pendulum. Um, I think each has their own merits. Um, and so I think it's it's a good question that you raised that I think we'll need to bring back a more full kind of, you know. Brett, um, kind of the big picture is, Mike, the big picture is because of this issue, um, we are taking a rather conservative projection on our demands, not moving much from where we are now, which is... Um, would be atypical in that historically we always see after a drought a bounce back, but because of our financial situation and I think the sense we have that this may be different and we may not see that bounce back and it would be very risky to crystal ball and predict <laughs> what a bounce back may be given if you're wrong with not much reserves. So I, I think we'll bring that back, but I think the fact that we're being on the conservative side on the demand um, mitigates a fair amount of that risk. Great, thanks. Just maybe one other uh, question, Brett. I hadn't realized that water connection fee setting is has so many variables to consider. Mm. So the goal of the study is to ensure that our fee structure for new water connections is really adequately covering the costs associated. We're we're just we're 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 making sure that the connections the fee connection strategy best addresses the costs related to those. Yeah, that's exactly right. And there are a lot of options to take and it is, you know, still subject to the 218 process as the property related fee. Um, and so I think the idea is, is that, you know, existing customers have been paying for years to invest in the infrastructure, you know, needed to provide water to each residence or each business and, you know, in what case it may be. So if you come on, you know, 110 years late in the game, <laughs> you've missed out, you know, on your fair share the whole way through. And so I think, you know, the one way, which is the way we do it now, which is the buy-in methodology is you... You kind of pay your fair share for the current level of all of our assets, you know, divided by how much, you know, what proportion you're going to be taking of water, you know, from that system. I think, you know, in, in the other way of looking at that is if you're going to be, you know, requiring new water for the community, um, what's that going to cost and what's your proportional share of that new water demand? And so whether it's new water, just water or new water infrastructure, you kind of look either backward looking or forward looking or maybe a combination of the two. Um and so that's really what we need to take a look at with the consultant is what's the best and most proportional way. So it is maybe a detail, but just so the board understands, 
it, it's not 218 that governs it, so we wouldn't be doing a mailer with protests, that sort of stuff. But the, there are legal standards you have to meet, and it's probably an area generally most agencies are more susceptible or you see more challenges on this and you actually do rate setting yeah. and that comes from developers so yeah. it in addition to all the variables having it molly will be very involved because it's got to be defensible well there's a public hearing right yes yeah there are government code provisions that that do address exactly how, how you have to go through the process and the requirements even the requirements for how you account afterwards it's all yeah I, I just want to state, um, you, to Larry's point, Matt's point, I think Jed said it too, the learning that we um, attain in these, in these current, you know, committee meetings uh, slash board meetings is, is a, I mean, I had no idea that it was so many considerations related to a new connection. And, and you ain't seen nothing yet. When the developers get involved, it, it's real dollars to them. You know, like we have these 14,000 houses, right, coming we're talking about real money now you know places like contra costa water or even east bay mud for that matter in the more developing areas east bay mud across the hills um it it, it can float the whole water district the fees it can be uh, i have clients where two-thirds of their budget is coming from those fees so it's really big dollars and it and, and it's interesting too, you know, because the developer has to build the infrastructure and then turns it over and there's still a fee attached. So it's a little interesting how that works. Um, but it's really large numbers to a developer and it all up front. Money, comments? Yeah, a couple of quick ones. Um, uh, you know, I think the demand side uh, uh, is probably one of the, I, when I look at the graph, I, I, I'm always surprised at how much consumption there was in in 2020 and 2021, given how dry things were. And then I remember how stuck at home we all were. And, um, and, and previously I would go into San Francisco three, four days a week. And now I was home. So it was my, my kids and my wife and we were all together and how much more water consumption I think just came out of that. And I think, so looking at demand patterns must be the, one of the most elusive things, right? The second, because we, we do have, I think that with every passing drought and, and, and the, the sequential ones that we've been in persisting, I think there really is a stickiness that we have not seen before. Um, we've also had rebate programs where we've taken out, we've helped people take out grass and it's not coming back. And that's a permanent reduction in use. Um, we also now have people going back to work and not being at home. So good luck, Brett. No, um, no, but I, I know you're thinking about all these things and I think it's just helpful to point that out. Um, the, the other thing I want to go back to is the paving costs. I really want to make sure that we are doing something to try to address that. That's a big number um, and it will be a big number into the future. And I know we've been briefed about it before. I don't know if, when we can kind of have that come back to the board to discuss. I know that I think all of us have expressed an interest to to try to help with that situation, which seemed, which seems unfair. And 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 if and we want to do the fair thing, we're 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 part of our community, we're part of our city governments, we want to do the right thing, but it's not. Um, we want to not be charged unfairly as well, because then it goes on to our people's water rates instead of, um, and to, instead of their taxes that pay for roads and so forth. So. We, uh, on that, just a brief update, we'll be coming back to the board on a number of related items, including kind of developing a strategy and a schedule and an approach. We are moving on the first item that we identified, which is to bring on board a paving expert to help us formulate the strategy, to help us understand industry standards as they compare to the county and other standards here and give us that foundational understanding and um, the power of information as we formulate our strategy. Great. Thanks, Moni. Yeah, I, I've definitely heard a willingness to talk with us about it. So we're, we're motivated to help you get those conversations going. 
Um, Brett, I think your your presentation was great once again, and super appreciative of all your hard work. And I know you got a lot lot coming up in the coming months, so we're here to support. Um, it also highlights the remarkable losses that this agency has been taking on and is taking on. I mean, th these are serious dollars that we're losing. Um, it also, I think, is is an interesting note that our conservation message seems to be hitting that that people are conserving water. And and there's a financial benefit from that, which is that our long term supply of water, our short term supply of water actually is extending. If this is a new baseline, if there isn't a bounce back like people are expecting, if people are hearing the message that converting your turf to native species to reducing waste is something that can benefit all of us, that could put off. A hundred million dollar water project that we that we have to think about funding in the future. So there's an enormous benefit to this. So getting the PL right, getting our, I don't know if we call it a PL, getting our, you know, trying to, you know, make sure we balance our budget is critical, obviously. But there will be a benefit in the future if we can get that message out that you can save and it'll avoid us having to spend enormous capital money in the future. So I think we can move on a to a closed session. One more, Larry? Yes, more. Um, you may or may not have followed Cynthia Kohler in uh, her, her speaking, but she often referred to conservation as an additional water source or a new water source because it is. And, and it has been effective. To that end, and to keep in mind, um, I've lived in the water business for my basically my entire life. And um, I never really worried about water consumption. You know, I mean, I thought about it, but I never worried about it. My wife and I are still using 57 gallons a day total. Um, and, you know, that is where we're going to be because we're paying attention to that level. And you know, I think you're going to see a lot of the tier ones in that, especially the ones with AMI who have the ability to instantaneously look at that up. The other thing I want to say is that I think the net zero is the single most important thing we can achieve in this uh, connection fee. I think it's a critical uh, factor and I think it's a fairness factor that, um, you know, force forward the net zero and it, the problem is defining what that really means huh? how, how are you going to do it you know I, I hear phil Sauter and i and i i love phil but you know he just doesn't seem to have the thinking about the what the purple pipe the reach the difficulties in getting it in in the communities you know it's really hard and tearing up all the streets to do that is even harder He's great. He's right. He's great. Great idea. But the implementation is not so easy, which is why they went to DPR. I mean, that's that's where DPR's roots are, is that people just said it's too expensive to do this with IPR. So anyway, with that, I'm done. Terrific. Yes. There are I, no comments. No public comments. Great. All right. So we'll, we're going to move to a closed session. Thank you very much, Brett and staff. Uh, and um, we will uh, adjourn this part of the meeting and we will reconvene after. And Terry, just confirming there are no public comments. Yes, the and there are session. no public comments yeah. on any of the yeah. items. Thank you. Closed session items. Thank you. Great. Uh, we are reconvening the um, Marine Municipal Water District uh, Finance Administration meeting after closed session, uh, which we closed at 4.13 p.m. and nothing to report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Terry, speaking again.